Hi and welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Vince. Thanks for stopping by. You're very welcome here indeed. So, following Dr. Brad Stanfield's latest Why I Stopped video, this one about resveratrol and pterostilbene, um, some of you were concerned and quite a few of you have asked about my opinion on his video. So, enough waffling off me. Let's jump into the video and see what I think about Dr. Brad Stanfield's latest why I stopped video. So as you know, I'm not an MD or a PhD in the longevity field. So I'm not gonna pick apart the medical content of Brad's video. I'm just gonna give my own opinion, which is what you've asked for as a layperson who is following a certain anti-aging regime. And I'm just sharing that journey on YouTube. When I first saw the thumbnail, I, like you possibly, was a little intrigued, but then this is the job of the thumbnail. Um, there are many YouTube gurus who will advise you on the best tactics you need to use to grow your channel. One of them is to use a face on the thumbnail. Um, and if you can muster up a shocked look of expression, or a shocked look or an expression, then all the better. Some people can do this, I can't. Uh, after watching the video, I wasn't overly concerned. The latest study that Brad talks about is eight months ago. And if David Sinclair or indeed his family members had said that they were going to stop or reduce their intake of resveratrol after taking it for more than 10 years, then possibly I would have paid a little bit more attention. That said, I had a lot of comments um, from my viewers, and I'm assuming Brad's viewers as well, asking me for my opinion. Uh, and a lot of people saying that now following that video, that they were going to stop taking resveratrol um, or they were going to use what they've got and they were then not going to order it again. And that second reason seems a little bit strange. Um, if you now think that it's bad for you, why would you continue using it until uh, it's, it's run out? That seems strange. Um, as always, this is just my opinion. It's not a recommendation and it's certainly not medical or life advice. So enough waffling off me. Let's get into it. Resveratrol made headlines in 2006, where some research showed that it could increase the survival in mice that were fed a high calorie diet. It also seemed to improve muscle function, insulin sensitivity and boost the mitochondrial number. And it was thought that resveratrol was doing this by activating an enzyme called sirtuin-1. So to explain why I've stopped taking resveratrol, we need to go through the timeline, starting with the initial excitement in 2006, the controversy in 2010, the counter to that controversy, and then a couple of knockout blows, with the latest one coming last year in 2020. I'll also share with you what I do instead of taking resveratrol, and then we'll finish up with an apology to all of you. So let's get into it. So, so good intro, setting the scene, what he's going to talk about. Always good to have that at the beginning of a video. Uh, he talks specifically about a timeline, which is good. Uh, it's something that I will use as a metric to possibly question the timing, the need and the agenda, hidden or otherwise, about this particular video. Uh, and he's also given an apology. I'm not sure why he thinks he needs to give an apology. He, like most YouTubers in the longevity space, just report on the facts. They don't advise and they don't make recommendations. That's the job of the PhDs who conduct the studies and then write the reports. So first of all, what are sirtuins? So there's an enzyme in yeast called Silent Information Regulator 2, or SIR2, which is now also known as sirtuins. And it's this enzyme that generated so much excitement because in 1999, a second copy of SIR2 was put into yeast and it extended the yeast lifespan by 30%. Around that time, it was also suggested that the beneficial effects of calorie restriction were because of SIR2. Now mammals have got seven different sirtuin enzymes and it's sirtuin-1 that's the most similar to the yeast SIR2. So now the race is on to find a molecule that will activate sirtuin-1 and hopefully extend the lifespan of mammals. Okay, so the first date where resveratrol was studied appears to be in 1999. So it shows that resveratrol as a compound has now been studied for over 20 years. So that brings us to 2003, where a lab suggested that resveratrol is a potent activator of sirtuin-1. So we can see there that the 2003 trial um, is where David Sinclair appears on the scene. 
um, and started to take an interest in resveratrol. So he's been into this for about 18 years. And that 2003 trial was a petri dish trial where they looked at individual cells. Now we need to see whether this resveratrol theory is going to play out in mammals. So that brings us to a mice trial in 2006, where that trial it claimed that resveratrol shifts the physiology of middle-aged mice on a high-calorie diet towards that of mice on a standard diet and significantly increased their survival. So it produced changes associated with longer lifespan, it reduced insulin-like growth factor 1 levels, and it boosted the mitochondrial number and improved muscle function. So okay, so another trial in 2006 that also included David Sinclair, um, showing that resveratrol does have some positive effects. So after publishing that paper, it seems like science had figured out a way to extend lifespan and to boost muscle function. So naturally, there was a lot of excitement around resveratrol, and the company that owned the intellectual property around resveratrol was called Sertris. So Glasgow Smith Klein. It okay, so you just called it Glasgow Smith Klein. Um, I thought a doctor might have known it's called Glaxo Smith Klein. Maybe a slip of the tongue. We'll have to wait and see. It bought out Sertris for $720 million in 2008, thinking that resveratrol was going to be the next big thing in health. But then came the controversy. A group from Amgen in 2009 wanted to figure out whether resveratrol actually activated sirtuins in the first place. And what they found was pretty shocking. It seems that there was a flaw in the fluorescence that was used to figure out if the sirtuins are being activated or not. And what this group found is that resveratrol, it doesn't activate sirtuin 1 in these petri dish cells. And the group concluded that this data, it challenges the idea that resveratrol can be used as a way to directly activate sirtuin 1. So overall, this group at Amgen was suggesting that there was an issue with the way in which the sirtuins were being measured. It wasn't the resveratrol that was activating the sirtuins, it was the fluorescence that was activating the sirtuins. And this finding was backed up in 2010, where a separate study also suggested that resveratrol it doesn't lead to an activation of sirtuins, instead what was happening was an issue with the fluorescence. So that is a remarkable finding. These groups were suggesting that the initial excitement around resveratrol activating sirtuins, it was nothing more than a lab error. Nonetheless, Glasgow Smith Klein continued with their trials, looking into resveratrol. Okay, so it, appear, it appears that the controversy started way back in 2009. So there have been questions about resveratrol's efficacy for over now 12 years. Let's carry on. And that brings us onto a trial of 24 patients that had multiple myeloma. Now, because resveratrol has a low bioavailability, Glasgow Smith Klein used a micronized oral formulation of resveratrol. And unfortunately, kidney failure happened in the first two cycles of giving resveratrol. To make matters worse, the multiple myeloma, it continued to progress in four out of five patients at the time of their kidney failure. And two patients had to be discharged for palliation. Following these cases, a medical review meeting recommended further monitoring and recruitment needs to be stopped following these serious adverse events. The paper finishes by concluding, this study demonstrates an unacceptable safety profile and minimal effect in patients with multiple myeloma. So this study of resveratrol was stopped early because it was causing kidney failure and unfortunately those patients passed away. And after that failure, Coupled with the new evidence that resveratrol probably doesn't activate sirtuins directly, Glasgow Smith Klein stopped development of resveratrol. Instead, they started focusing their efforts on selective sirtuin activator compounds that have got no chemical relationship to resveratrol. Okay, so multiple myeloma is a cancer that forms in a type of white blood cell, uh, and that's called a plasma cell. So is this a bit of a red herring? Um, is this really relevant? Do we take um, resveratrol in the anti-aging community to treat um, blood cancer? Um, this is where a drug company tried to use resveratrol not as an anti-aging supplement, but as a cancer treatment. Not really pertinent unless you suffer from multiple myeloma. So that, that could be a point that Brad could have made here. Um, if you suffer from multiple myeloma, then you shouldn't take resveratrol. Uh, if you don't, then it's not really an issue.
So far then, we've got evidence that resveratrol, it doesn't directly activate sirtuins. And Glasgow Smith Klein, that paid $720 million, wanting to do everything possible to get resveratrol onto the market, they've stopped development. So after five years of owning Sertra's pharmaceuticals, Glasgow Smith Klein shut the doors. Now, one of the famous arguments for why resveratrol wasn't having an effect in clinical trials was because it wasn't being absorbed, that it needed to be mixed with a fat such as yogurt or olive oil. But like we've gone through, the issue isn't absorption. The issue is how resveratrol actually works. We've got a lot of data showing that resveratrol doesn't directly activate sirtuins. And those experiments are cells in a petri dish where resveratrol is given to those cells. Again, they can see that resveratrol doesn't directly activate sirtuins. So it's not an issue of absorption. It's an issue with how resveratrol actually works. So I'm, I'm now going to play a clip uh, because we know what David Sinclair's stance is on this. I'm now going to play a clip where David Sinclair's opinion on absorption is very, very clearly explained. Well, let's have a look what Dr. David Sinclair has to say. So Dr. Sinclair appeared on a podcast on the 5th of February 2020 with Chris Kesson. And I'm going to quote Dr. Sinclair now. But the point is that, so resveratrol dissolves in yogurt or something fatty, which is what you need. Otherwise, you're basically eating brick dust, and it'll go straight through you. And some clinical trials have failed with resveratrol because they didn't know how to deliver it. You can't just pop a dry pill, unfortunately. So this is a really key insight that Dr. Sinclair gives us. So we need to make sure that we're taking resveratrol properly. So potentially, this last trial failed because it wasn't delivering the resveratrol to the patients. The resveratrol wasn't getting into the cells where it could activate the sirtuins. So for me, personally, I think there is enough human evidence for me to justify the expense and the time to take resveratrol. I just make sure to take it with yogurt in the mornings, and I take one gram. But I also want to pose it to you. Glasgow Smith Klein spent millions and millions of dollars. Surely it's a bit patronizing to suggest that the only reason why they shuttered the doors on resveratrol was because they hadn't thought of pairing resveratrol with a fatty food. Do you really think they didn't try and get a return on their investment by considering this possibility? But out of this disappointment, there was a sirtuin activating compound that was discovered that made it through the initial safety trials in healthy volunteers. So if this theory of activating sirtuins works, then we should see awesome benefits in type 2 diabetics. So that's exactly what Glasgow Smith Klein wanted to have a look at. So they tested type 2 diabetics with this molecule that activates sirtuins, and unfortunately, it didn't lead to any consistent dose-related changes in blood sugar levels or insulin, which once again is an alarming finding. We've got a molecule that now activates sirtuins, but it's not helping type 2 diabetics. So it does beg the question, will activating sirtuins with molecules or medications help? Because there is some controversy with activating sirtuins. Okay, so this could be another red herring. Is anyone watching this um, video taking resveratrol to specifically lower their blood sugar? Yes, David Sinclair. Um, has David Sinclair ever said he's taking resveratrol to lower his blood sugar? Now, we know there's a, a history of diabetes in his family, but that's why he is taking metformin and not resveratrol. So maybe this is just a drug company who spent a lot of money, as Brad says, uh, are looking for another use for resveratrol. It didn't work in blood cancer. It's not worked in blood sugar. What are they going to try and look for next? So the role of sirtuins in lifespan extension by calorie restriction has long been challenged because there's several reports showing that sirtuins aren't required for the lifespan extension by calorie restriction in yeast C. elegans, or fruit flies. Even the deletion of all sirtuins in yeast doesn't prevent the effects of calorie restriction. Okay, but even if resveratrol doesn't directly activate sirtuins, maybe it still helps. So to explore this idea, we've got a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind trial that tried to figure out if resveratrol can help in low-grade inflammation associated with obesity and metabolic syndrome. So they took people with an average age of 50 who suffered from obesity, and they divided them into three groups. One group took 1,000 milligrams of resveratrol, another group took 150 milligrams, and the final group took placebo. And they did this trial for 16 weeks. 
Resveratrol did not improve inflammation, blood sugar level, blood pressure, or fatty liver. Instead, rather shockingly, resveratrol it significantly increased total cholesterol compared to placebo. So not only does resveratrol not appear to directly activate sirtuins, but it may increase our cholesterol levels. Okay, so we need to look at the dates of these trials, and this is where I'm going to um, focus in on the timeline and possibly the reason for Brad doing these type of videos. So there was a May 2017 trial and a January 2019 trial that he's just referenced, so four years ago and two years ago. Brad's first video was in 2019 in November 2019 and he started to big up resveratrol if you like in December 2019. So at that time the latest study had been available for 10 months and the older study had been around for 30 months. So despite these two studies being around for either 10 months or 30 months he still went ahead and made resveratrol videos uh, and promoted them on his channel. And the final knockout punch for the theory that resveratrol activates the tuins was a study that was done in 2020 and it used CRISPR technology, which is cutting edge. Using this technology, it shows that resveratrol had very similar properties to another molecule called hydroxyurea that causes cell stress. This study also proved that resveratrol and terastilbene, they do not directly activate sirtuins. Instead, these results establish that the primary impact of resveratrol on human cells is by causing low-level stress. So that experiment used the most cutting-edge technology that we've got when looking at genes. So using CRISPR technology, we can see that resveratrol doesn't directly activate sirtuins. Instead, what resveratrol is doing is stressing the cell. So since resveratrol stresses the cell, that brings us onto the other argument for taking resveratrol, in that resveratrol helps exercise benefits. So at first sight, this report, this CRISPR report, um, does seem quite damning. But the statement at the end where Brad says resveratrol stresses the cell, this is exactly in line with what David Sinclair says. It doesn't talk about the level of stress, it just says it stresses it. And David Sinclair often mentions this, um, and the phrase he uses, or the technical term, is hormesis. So molecular stress is good for you, whereas mental or psychological stress is not. And what we want to do is trick our bodies into thinking there's adversity. Mm. Biological stress, not emotional stress, but biological stress. Okay. So now we understand why does exercise make us healthier and live longer? Why does being hungry make us live longer? Why do all these things, eating good foods, mm. it's because they're turning on these body defenses, these longevity genes that we work on. Mm. And that's the revelation. They're in all of us, but we, they become complacent unless we trick our bodies into getting this feeling of, of uh, adversity. Adversity. So it's, we call this hormesis. Okay. Hormesis is what doesn't kill you makes you live longer. So to test this theory, there was a study done on 27 inactive but otherwise healthy men. And half of them took 250 milligrams of resveratrol, whereas the other half took placebo. And they did this study for eight weeks. Both groups did high intensity exercise training. What they found is that there was a 45% greater increase in the maximal oxygen uptake in the placebo group compared to resveratrol. So overall, resveratrol, it stops the positive effects on exercise. And once again, resveratrol, it also worsened cholesterol levels. And just as a side note, in this trial, sirtuin 1, it wasn't affected by resveratrol supplementation. And it wasn't just one trial that confirmed this. So Brad spoke earlier uh, about a timeline. Um, this trial was conducted in 2013, eight years ago. Now, if you hadn't paused the video and quickly looked at the top where he, um, where the date of the trial is, you may be um, think incorrectly that this followed the 2008 CRISPR trial in that he's following the timeline of this resveratrol um, uh, efficacy issue, if you like. Um, so this trial was eight years before the 2000. Uh, 2020 CRISPR knockout blow trial. So I'm guessing that when they were taking this resveratrol um, eight years ago, it was in dry powder form or it was in tablets. It wasn't mixed into fatty food. And we'll see in a minute that in February 2020, seven years after this study, 
Brad explains in one of his early videos that mixing resveratrol into fatty food is actually key. So when he's making a video um, that's bigging up resveratrol, he can say that taking resveratrol is, uh, with, with fatty food is key. But when he's trying to criticize resveratrol, it looks like he's quite happy to not mention that again. We've got a second trial that again shows the same thing. So let's sum things up. We've got good evidence showing that... Res so again, if you're following the timeline, you may have thought that second trial was a new trial, but that took place in April 2014, which was seven years ago. So he's had six years to research this particular paper. Uh, and if it were a showstopper, as it seems to be now, he should have never started promoting resveratrol five years later on his channel in 2019. So could we make the accusation that Brad is cherry picking his trials and then cherry picking, cherry picking the statements in those trials to fit the narrative of his latest video? Um, watch this clip now from 2020, where Brad references four clinical trials, studies on resveratrol, and uses the fatty food argument to make his case to forget about the fourth trial altogether. Now, we don't want to look at what other blogs, or heavens forbid, what Wikipedia is saying about resveratrol. We want to go to the heart of the evidence. We want to say, what does the research actually tell us? So if we go onto PubMed, and PubMed is a database of different journal articles and clinical trials, we can search through the latest research on resveratrol. So if we type in resveratrol and sirtuins, we're making sure that we're looking at clinical trials over the past five years and just in humans. We come up with seven trials that we can have a look at. Now one of these trials looks at resveratrol in infants, which isn't really applicable to most of us. And another trial doesn't focus on sirtuin activation. So really, we've got five trials that we can have a look at to see whether resveratrol will actually activate our sirtuins. So the first trial looks at resveratrol on type 2 diabetics. And yes, it does show that we can boost our sirtuin activation. The second trial looks at slightly overweight but otherwise healthy individuals. And it does show that by giving resveratrol, we can boost our sirtuin activation. This third trial is a double blind trial. And double blind trials are awesome. It means that the participants don't exactly know what they're taking. It could be resveratrol, it could be placebo, and the researchers don't know either. It removes all other factors that get in the way of the truth. It means that we'll get to the nitty gritty and figure out does resveratrol actually activate sirtuins. And this trial is showing that the sirtuin levels are significantly higher in patients that receive resveratrol. So that's really compelling. This fourth trial again looked at slightly overweight but otherwise healthy individuals. So it's confirming what the second trial said, and it does show that we are boosting our sirtuin activation. And this last trial is where things get really interesting. So it gave resveratrol to patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and it showed that there was no significant changes in the sirtuin activation when they took resveratrol. So this is weird, right? We've got four trials showing that yes, by taking resveratrol, we can boost our sirtuin activation. But then this last trial says no, there's no difference. So should we be bothering with resveratrol at all? So potentially, this last trial failed because it wasn't delivering the resveratrol to the patients. The resveratrol wasn't getting into the cells where it could activate the sirtuins. So for me, personally, I think there is enough human evidence for me to justify the expense and the time to take resveratrol. I just make sure to take it with yogurt in the mornings, and I take one gram. So let's sum things up. We've got good evidence showing that resveratrol doesn't directly activate sirtuins. Instead, it stresses the cell, but unfortunately that stress doesn't seem to be good for us. It boosts cholesterol, and it seems to get in the way of exercise benefits. So why would anyone take it? Well, why would anyone take it? I think because there seems to be just as many studies saying that it works as there are that says it doesn't work. And for the studies where it didn't work in the early years, nine, ten, seven, eight years ago, Brad and everyone else, including David Sinclair, is happy to say the reason is is because it's not mixed into the fatty food. Um, Brad himself, up until the CRISPR study eight months ago, seemed happy to push or promote and take resveratrol and only show the trials that were positive, even though there have been trials with negative results from as far back as 2009, which is 12 years ago. And this is where I do need to apologize to all of you who follow my channel. 
So I try and focus on the evidence pyramid, as in what the good human clinical trials show. When I first started looking into resveratrol and making videos on it, I got caught up in opinion and hype which clouded my judgement when I looked at these trials, and I'm sorry. This journey to figuring out that resveratrol and pterostilbene, it likely does more harm to healthy ageing than good, it's been truly humbling and I'm disappointed that I didn't see this earlier. All I can say to you is, again, I'm sorry and I'm going to strive to always do better. So, um, there's lots of ways to look at this. Uh, an MD who gets caught up in opinion and hype that clouds his judgment. But the human medical studies that he supported from his February 2020 video weren't opinion and hype. They were human clinical studies posted on pub, pubmed.gov. And as he says, he follows the, the pyramid and does what the good human clinical trials show. If you use the same logic, well, maybe the CRISPR study is now just opinion and hype. Um, also, I'm not comfortable with people giving these kind of apologies, especially when those people hold positions of authority and trust. Now, I've read in the comment section of this video, a lot of people seem to think that this video has improved their opinion of him. Now, I think apologies are warranted. Uh, for example, if a drunk driver kills someone or a doctor misprescribes a drug that causes an unfavorable outcome, then certainly an apology should be forthcoming with also the, the, the relevant um, legal ramifications. So sticking with apologies, I think apologies are all well and good if they are really, really warranted. People generally apologize for three reasons. There are more, and the three reasons I'm gonna give you can be combined to a certain degree. Uh, number one, they truly believe that what they've done was wrong, or they've made a genuine mistake, and they will do everything in their power to put that right. Um, or, number two, they're told to apologize by a superior, or a parent, or a friend, because it is the right thing to do, or it's gonna reduce some kind of uh, ramification. Or, number three, it's a self-deprecating apology that's only there to garner support or sympathy. But why apologize? He hasn't made any recommendations to his viewers. He just passes on the science as he sees it and gives his opinion, and he tells them what he is doing. Yes, the science in some cases can be contradictory, but that's not his fault uh, and it's not unheard of. Not everyone agrees that statins are the wonder drug. Not everyone agrees that resveratrol, or NMN for that matter, is effective in humans. Even David, David, David Sinclair has admitted that. So why did he apologize? In my humble opinion, there's two reasons. Uh, it's either incompetence or he wanted to only focus on the positive, so maybe he had tunnel vision. So either he has no idea what he's talking about, and that's doubtful because you don't become an MD by being ignorant or um, blind, um, or he allowed himself for some reason to be carried along with the hype because it was advantageous to him in some way. Um, what do you think? I'm guessing that you agree with me that he's not stupid, so do you think that he agreed with this from the time he started his channel, ignored the negative studies, only focused on the positive ones up until um, the CRISPR study? Um, and if so, why do you think he did that? Now, I would expect an MD to take more care. Um, as we've seen, there, are, there have been negative trials with resveratrol as far back as 2009. That's 12 years ago. And he seems to have been ignoring them until this CRISPR study last September. And I'm just wondering why. Um, now he's an MD, is this the way that you want your doctor to act? Is this what you would like him to do to you? I want my doctor to be empathetic, to be painfully clinical in what he does, and to be objective, and not to get caught up in opinion and hype that clouds their judgment, and possibly causes me some harm. As of right now, instead of taking resveratrol, I make sure to eat a good diet, I exercise regularly, I do safe fasting, and I support my NAD levels by taking a molecule called niacin. When I reach my mid to late 30s, that's when I'll reintroduce NR or NMN. So I really hope you found this video useful about resveratrol and pterostilbene. And I want to give a massive thank you to all of my patrons who support the channel. Okay, so uh, for those that don't know, Patreon is a way that um, people can support 
creators like Brad and myself, uh, and they generally pay for extra content. So Brad offers extra advice to those people that can afford it. Um, we don't know exactly what extra benefits they get because most of the content is behind the paid wall. But you can see here that a $9 a month Patreon gets to discuss the most cutting edge research and help them to achieve their goals. So although all of the science was out there, good and bad, um, if he was mirror in his YouTube channel behind the Patreon paywall, he was taking money for badly researched content. He was being dragged along with opinion and hype, and he's sorry for that. Um, so maybe a refund for his $9 patrons might be in order. Uh, I'm sure that if he did offer it, they probably wouldn't take it, but maybe something to think about. So his latest video, um, the one from the 9th of May, which is this one, the one that's prompted my review, has got no new information in it whatsoever. This is all the same information that was available eight months ago, and it's the same information that has been in the two videos he's produced since this report in September last year. So why wasn't this knockout blow video posted eight months ago following the CRISPR report? Why did he wait until now? So when I was in the army, we would call this a slow flash to bang time. It took him eight months to read over the study, but still have time to produce two videos saying that resveratrol um, has performed badly. Um, before deciding to actually quit taking resveratrol. But again, not before making a third video covering all the same information that he covered in the first two. Now, would you want your doctor to act in the same way? Bear in mind that Brad is an MD. So if he prescribed you something in January and he knew it was doing you harm or wasn't working in January, would you be happy that he let you continue taking it until August, eight months later, before he actually stopped you taking that particular medication, whatever it was. Would you be happy with that? Now, I think another point that is noteworthy is that his other resveratrol videos, uh, videos one to seven, and he's made 10 videos about resveratrol altogether, the last three being critical and talking about the CRISPR study, are still up. So he's still allowing people to watch his videos where he's bigging up resveratrol and talking about all the positive benefits. Uh, I think that if he thinks resveratrol is not effective and actually it could cause you harm, he should do the right thing and he should take those videos down uh, as soon as possible. Or with a loss in YouTube ad revenue from taking those videos down, be too hard for him to stomach. Uh, time will tell. Also, some of his NMN NR videos mention resveratrol, um, where he uses the accelerator pedal analogy that Sinclair talks about, David Sinclair talks about, uh, maybe he should take those down as well. Um, if Brad really believes that resveratrol is not beneficial and actually can have a negative effect on you when he's talked about the negative um, studies, then I really think he should cons consider taking those videos down. And if it were me, I would consider taking, I would consider giving my patrons their money back. And I wouldn't feel the need to tell everyone I've done that. And I wouldn't feel the need to make another video to explain that I've taken down videos one to seven. Now, apologies and words are fine. They're all well and good. But if you fall short of the mark, which Brad admits he has done up until now, actions speak louder than words. Remember the reasons, the first reason for an apology is that the people or the person truly believes that they have done wrong or made a genuine mistake and they will do everything to put that right everything in their power to put that right. Just saying sorry and carrying on as if nothing has happened, not putting right the things that you got wrong in the past, like leaving seven videos up, I think um, is not good. And I think it rings a bit of an, an empty apology. Now, that last bit may have sounded like a hatchet job on it. I may have been critical. Some people who like Brad might think it's overcritical. Some people might say, I haven't gone far enough. I don't know where you are on the continuum. I followed Brad probably from his first or second video, but I watched nearly all of them because I went back and watched the ones if I picked up his third or fourth, I went back and watched one, two, and three. Um, the majority of what he says is on point. I, I think that his content is great. He just passes on the information in a clear and logical way. The only issue I've got with this video is the unchronological timeline that is a little bit is a little bit misleading. 
and the sudden change in protocol now when there's been no new evidence for eight months. So nothing for eight months. He produces two videos, but then this this shocking I, why I stopped video, like the NMN one, um, the need for this third video, uh, it, it's it's slightly baffling to me. I'd be interested to see what you think about the, the, the timeline and why there was such a big gap between the CRISPR study, two videos that obviously were made to say resveratrol doesn't work and can harm you, and then the need for this third one, maybe a sensationalized video uh, and thumbnail to say, I've stopped taking it. Let me know what you think in the comments below. So there it is, just my opinion, and I'd be interested in your opinion or my opinion of Brad's video. So, so why listen to me? Who, who the hell am I? Um, if you were gonna lead, if you were gonna talk to someone or if there was some kind of pecking order in the longevity field, specifically to, to do with resveratrol, then I think David Sinclair would be right at the top. Then there'd be a raft of other PhDs. Then there'd probably be a pile of more seasoned medical doctors. Then there'd be Brad. Then there'd be a whole raft of people from the YouTube world. And then somewhere near the bottom, there would be me. So am I still going to take resveratrol having now seen this latest video of Brad? Because that seems to be the, the trend or that seemed to be the main question that people were asking me. So yes, I will be taking it, but why? Well, David Sinclair has been taking it for more than 10 years and he's in his 50s and I think he looks pretty good. His father, who is in his 80s, takes it and he is fit and healthy too. David Sinclair doesn't give medical advice. He tells you what he does, same with me. Um, this is what I take and this is what is happening to me. And I think all things taken, I think that's what Brad should start doing. Uh, and that's what he should stick to going forward. Now, I don't want this to sound like a slight on Dr. Brad. Uh, I want my criticism to come across constructively because that's the way I, I wrote it. Um, but if I was given the choice, I would, of, of, of listening to a PhD who's worked in the longevity field for decades and with respect to an MD in his 20s, I know who I would listen to first and I know who I would and I'm still following first. I'd be interested to know your comments or your thoughts on the statement I've just made. Now, I was more than a little concerned when um, I read the comments, the, the, the comments that, that portrayed panic, worry and concern that this video has caused um, by people who watch me and obviously Brad. I think all YouTubers should choose their words wisely and only use words in their script like bombshell, shocking, knockout blow, alarming, when they are really, really warranted. And I'm gonna close by saying that I believe that any YouTuber who is seen as an authority in their field has a moral obligation, no matter how many followers they have, to be careful with the words that they choose and they don't over sensationalize a subject for whatever reason.